everyone for coming. This is a, a, a great turnout for a lunchtime talk, and especially given the time of year, um, it's really appreciated. Uh, we have a very special lunchtime talk today, um, and Victoria will start by introducing her postgrad research, and then we'll open the discussion with Ayushi, Anu, Anu, Aisha, and Danny um, to talk about their lived experience and how that connects to their research and design work at Sheffield. So um, I'll hand over to Victoria now to start a presentation on her research. Um, so yeah, take it away. Yeah, thank you. So first of all, thank you everyone for joining. Um, and special thank you to everyone who's come to talk with me here. Um, Danny, Anu, Anurina, Aishi, Ayushi. Um, because I think this really, for me, represents the ways in which we can come together. And I think this is something that's important to all of us, the ways in which we can come together um, from our different years, programs, positions, learnings, et cetera, to sort of make, uh, I don't know, just like solidarity, what we're trying to do together. Is, and this is also something that you'll see in our talk today. So I'm a PhD candidate. I used to be in the School of Architecture, now I'm in Urban Studies and Planning. Um, I did a really just a uh, small presentation, so I'll share that now. Sorry, no, sorry, 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 sorry. First, we were gonna introduce ourselves, yeah? I can't introduce, I can't speak for other people. I'll just say my name is Victoria. I'm a PhD candidate in Urban Studies and Planning. I'm Nigerian American. I'm an international student. Who wants to go next for the intros? Go on then, I'll go. Uh, I'm Danny Kerr and I'm an architect. Um, I'll go next. I'm Ayushi Bajwala and I'm trying to be an architect. <laughs> I'm in third year. <laughs> I love that. Oh, <laughs> Um, okay, I'll just go. Um, I'm Anu, I'm a fifth year MR, also trying to be an architect. <laughs> Uh, Hi everyone. Um, oh god. <laughs> <laughs> we should have put into the lab. Go ahead. Um, I'm Aisha, I'm third year. I'm just trying to be an architect as well. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, I'm also Anu. I'm a fourth year structural engineering and architecture student. Um, I'm going to sod off structural engineering and going up, go into architecture as well. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you all. So then I'll, I'll get started with my little small little presentation. So let me just share my screen. Share. Okay. Um, so for me, I'm doing collaborative research as part of my uh, doctoral research. So for me, it's really important to show the people that I'm working with. Um, so I'm doing collaborative research with an organization that's called Spread Out Initiative. It's in Accra, Ghana, which is in West Africa. So just from right to left, these are the people that I've been working with. Uh, this is Mustafa, Fati, Larry Aminu, who's the founder of the organization, Tikas, Mutawa Kiel, Faisal, and then obviously myself. So, you know, I, I just wanted to really just briefly talk about my own positionality. So I'm Nigerian American. I was born and raised in the US. My parents migrated to, from Nigeria, southeastern Nigeria, to the US in the 1970s. And I did my first and my second degrees in the United States. And uh, my background is urban studies and planning. And, you know, when I finished my second degree, I relocated to Accra, Ghana, which is located in West Africa. And I lived there for like seven and a half years doing work. And so this was a lot of collaborative approach, right? This is really for me how I really developed a, a strong interest and commitment in collaboration. So I was doing work with street and market vendors on things like um, inclusive design approaches for markets, uh, working with young people on like youth photography workshops and exhibitions. And then especially working with artists and creatives like Yusuf Laramino, the founder of the NGO, working on things like um, organizing street art festivals, public murals, um, short and longer term public space interventions. And so Larry started this organization a few years ago, Spread Out Initiative. It's a youth focused organization. They work with youth in this Nima neighborhood of Accra. And it's really, he comes from an artistic background. He's an activist. So it's really about bringing together um, sort of like learning opportunities, right? Really grounded in arts, creative, also like computer design to work with young people to sort of expand their, the ways in which they can understand what's possible for them, what they can tr contribute to the world. And so our work together as part of my doctoral research is working with these young people that are supported by the NGO to really explore their experiences of public and community space. So not just in terms of, you know, for example, the everyday experiences of marginalization and stuff, but also really thinking speculatively about what designs and possibilities 
they can imagine for their future. So this was things like writing stories and mapping, like you can see here. So the work that we've been doing is really grounded in the NGO's approach, which is arts-based methods. It's spatial research that we're doing, but it's also really structured in the way that the NGO operates, thinking about this work that we're doing together as teaching and pedagogy. So it's, it really informed also like the way in which we're, we were even working with young people. So not just working with these young people as individuals who we're getting information from, and then I'm gonna write a thesis. This was about you know, structuring our activities as workshops and learning moments where they're going out and getting information about their neighborhood, we're discussing and learning about it together, and then they're presenting it in various venues to their community, right? So presenting it to community residents, also presenting our work to uh, like local authorities. But also something that was really hugely, I think, important for me is the NGO's um, pan-Africanist approach and the way that they work with volunteers, interns, et cetera, and they think about the space in which they're creating for these young people. So if you haven't heard about Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanism is this idea that African people, both on the continent and in the diaspora, share not merely a common history, but a common destiny. It's a global movement for solidarity between all Black peoples, both Indigenous and African descent. And it's grounded in shared struggles. So first against enslavement and colonization, now within the afterlives of these projects and ongoing anti-Black racism, whether we're talking about in the UK or Nigeria or South Africa or the US. So Pan-Africanism has, Pan has a really long history dating back to like the 1800s um, and it's evolved over time. But for me, what's particularly significant is the way in which the Spare Arts Initiative NGO and Yusuf Larry Aminu in particular enacts this in the way that they work with young people. So this is about the ways in which they work with young people. They create the NGO space as a creative, a critical, a positive space for teaching and learning that's grounded in really um, their black identity, our black identity, right? So they reach out and they work with interns, volunteers, researchers who are black African from the diaspora, deliberately bringing in these people so that they can both learn from the Ghanaian perspective and, and the perspective of the NGO, but then also young people are seeing positive affirmations of blackness, right? And so this um, way of working and thinking really critically about what teaching can do also really informed for me what it means to be a doctoral researcher, at the University of Sheffield, doing a lot of teaching in the School of Architecture and thinking about how architecture is represented, right? And what my contribution to that might be. And so one of the first examples, one example I just wanna share with all of you is the very first time that I gave a, a lecture that I did some teaching at the School of Architecture was for this third year architecture course that's module that's called Urban Histories. And so I you know, prepared a lecture and gave it talking about modernist architecture and history of modernism and Accra continually striving to become a modern city. And after I gave this lecture, there were a couple of black students who came up to me and they were like, yeah, you know, okay, of course, you know, thank you for this lecture. But they said to me, you're the first, they said, we're in our third year and you're the first person of color that we've had as a lecture, right? So for me, this really struck me because it made me think a lot about um, questions of representation, both in terms of students and the student body and in terms of the staff and what is, why is this particularly important, right? Um, and it made me, and so this is something that, you know, in my first year I was a PGR representative in the student staff committee, and these were questions that I brought to the student staff committee, right? That this is an issue, that there needs to be better representation, and it's not just from my perspective as a PGR researcher, but also from students themselves, yeah? It also makes me think a lot about, in terms of when we're talking about the study in the, of architecture, like what are the histories of architecture and design that we're engaging with? For me as a black woman, this is particularly in terms of thinking about questions of enslavement and colonialism and contemporary racism and the ways that architecture has been used as a tool to facilitate all of these, yeah? It's also like, you know, whose academic scholarship is shaping our ideas? Um, which places do we study when we're studying, when we're looking for different architectural precedents, inspirations, examples? And, you know, whose perspective are we studying? Whose contributions are we studying? who's designing and building is, is considered to be architecture, right? And so I say this as someone who's of Igbo descent, coming from, you know, of Nigerian descent and recognizing the ways in which the, the heritage of white people is never gonna be studied at the, at the School of Architecture. Like it's not studied at the School of Architecture, it's very rich, but this is something that I think oftentimes we miss out on, yeah? And so for me, the starting point was really sort of, how can we, thinking of myself as a black woman, like how can black students across various years and programs know each other and support each other. 
And so this was in the School of Architecture. And this is actually, I think, how I first met Aisha. We started co-organizing, and it only ended up being a couple of these different sessions, but just co-organizing with Aisha, these informal gatherings of Black students from all different years at the School of Architecture, from undergrad, first year, all the way to the PhD. Because what we were realizing is like, we see each other maybe like in the elevator. I mean, before, obviously, lockdown. But like, we didn't know each other. So it became really important to sort of create this community in which we could just know each other. But then also, um, how do we reach across? I began to think, try to think wider, right? How do we reach across, connect, and collaborate with other students? For example, not just Black students, but more widely, understanding that we have a shared interest in addressing these kinds of questions. And so this really informed for me joining the, the EDI committee and sort of being engaged. And this is really actually how I met so many of those that, are, that are, we're all talking together. So I'll stop there. And I'll hand over to Aishi and Co to go ahead. Hi, um, I just wanted to say thank you very much for such a rich introduction. Um, I think I just wanted to point out from one of the things you said that's kind of leading on to this was the Pan-Africanist um, comment about how we have the same, not only the same histories, but also the same destinies, which is why like we've all kind of come here. And then when we remove, I guess, African from that picture as well, it's people of color. And that's why we're all here today, like talking about the same thing, but I guess in different um, kind of context, um, our own context ourselves. So thank you very much for that. Um, I was just gonna kind of go back and just talk about how um, we just met up and started to kind of work together, talk to each other and share our own differences. And then we realized that, okay like we're all going through something similar but different in the school what can we do to address this because like victoria said it's not something that you keep quiet about and for me personally growing up in gambia um i was never exposed to any of this um until coming to london and then sheffield and it was just like you see you kind of go through these things and then you think you can't really say anything because one you haven't been through it before and two who do you go to when there's no one there um, to represent you or anything like that so a conversation started between myself and Ayushi and like Victoria said I'd met her and then we kind of formed these groups with other black students in the school and just more conversations happened there so just kind of different I guess pockets of conversations and recognition of the lack of inclusion in academia and within the social environments as well. Um, so these could be some of the events that we've had so far, or just like within year groups, just how people relate to each other. There's a lot of barriers um, between that. I think personally, they don't need to exist. Um, so some of these students have graduated, but we all kind of came together and Ayushi and myself contributed to the anti-racism at Sheffield School of Architecture call to action letter. And I'd just like to ask you guys, using the raise hand feature, how many of you have heard about this call to action letter? Um, if everyone could just... Okay, so I see about 19, yeah, about 19 or so hands. And we've got 73 people here. So I feel like that in itself is quite telling of how far it's reached because even with those 19 hands if i ask how many people have read it how many people have signed it you'll see the numbers start to go down and i think this is very important because obviously we've all come together to one share our experiences and two kind of roadmap what we think um the uni should do to go forward and i've just seen jasmine join as well so she's not even in the school anymore but is still taking part in these things so um, I think we just need to come together and understand that it's important and it's something that we all have to engage with because it's everyone's responsibility, not just the people that wrote it. We can sit here and talk for days because we're personally invested, but at the end of the day, it takes everyone to make a difference. And yeah, that's all I have to say. I'll give it to Ayushi now. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much, uh, Victoria, for that amazing introduction and it's really nice to see your research and how it just kind of links into everything we've been up to this last year um and also Aisha that's yeah really well said like I think it's just so interesting like to see like where it all began and obviously it didn't begin with call to action it actually began way before that um and I was just sitting there and kind of remembering like how we all started recognizing and having these conversations, whether it started with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter or our own experiences within the school. Um, 
And I think it was such an important like moment with Call to Action because it was probably my first time talking about such experiences with other people who have experienced similar experiences. And um, I just wanted to quickly like go back to the title of this talk, um, which was Des our research design and lived experiences. And I think the part where it says lived experiences is just what speaks the most to me because um, it's just interesting to see how we have so many um, like similarities in terms of our experiences, but also differences. And it's interesting to, it's really good and important to celebrate those differences and how it makes us stand out. And I think celebrating difference is what I think sometimes at the school we struggle with because of um, what Victoria said earlier in terms of like what's considered like architecture. And I talk about, um, in my dissertation, I talk about centered knowledge and how we always have to come back and reference like Le Corbusier or something in our in our essays or in our research to for it to feel legitimate and it's this kind of disacknowledgement of difference in lived experiences whether it's between ourselves within our school um or the wider context and i think that's really important and um the goal was to really get as many people to read it and implement um the stuff we talk about in in a call to action and getting the message across as further as we can um and yeah it's just really good to see people raise hands today um yeah and i'm gonna move on to talk about the podcast now um which was kind of a follow-up from uh, call to action and i think it happened probably a couple months after we were kind of into our courses by then um and it kind of came about um from frustration about not seeing as much action as we hoped for um in the school and just in our circles um and also we joined edi by that point and it was kind of a reflection on um the what we were doing in edi um and i just wanted to ask um just a possible show of hands of anyone who has listened to the podcast um Yeah, so that's about about twenty ish. So similar to similar to call to action. Um, it's just really just really important to see like where this conversation is reached because um, often when we do things like this, we end up kind of remaining in our circles, and it's really interesting to see how far it kind of gets. And just quickly, I just wanted to mention a few aspects that we mentioned in the podcast and probably mentioned in Call to Action as well. Um, and we talked about all sorts of things such as course content, um, pub culture, um, and it's really nice actually to see future socials in COS especially, which are looking quite inclusive. Um, and staff diversity, uh, we talk about a lot. So if you haven't listened to the podcast, it'd be worth listening to. And I'm just gonna pass on to Anu now. Um. Yeah, and I think another thing that kind of inspired um, the uh, part of the podcast was uh, the uh, SSOA Voices Survey. So obviously at the end of the call to action letter, there are a lot of kind of like personal experiences where people talk about their kind of like lived experience at SSOA. And one thing that we wanted to pick up on um, through EDI is kind of giving a voice to everyone else at the school giving them an opportunity to kind of make their voice heard and their stories kind of told. And um, one thing that we spoke about in the podcast was this kind of SSOA voices survey and how there was actually a bit of con kind of controversy there, there because we sort of want to give them a platform where they can kind of um, put their voice in, but we don't want it to be kind of like a faceless Google form. Uh, so we decided to kind of give them the option of kind of doing maybe an interview at the end or something like that as well. Um, for those of you that don't know about EDI, by the way, um, it's the uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusions Committee at the um, school and it's formed of both students and staff and we kind of talk about the issues raised from the call to action letter and um, kind of what kind of action to take on it as well. Um, it's a kind of slow process. Um, I like to say that big wheels turn slow, but yeah, hopefully things will get a bit better. <laughs> um, yeah, going on to, back, back to Aisha. 
Yeah, um, I think I just wanted to add that something we highlighted within the podcast as well was just um, our experiences with EDI and the graduated students as well. Um, and it was just talking again about prioritizing things within the school. So we have many events that go on in the school, for example, um, the exhibitions and how a lot of attention and care is given to things like that. But then when it comes to initiatives that the EDI try to put together, like Anu said, we want to be helpful and say, um, I can't remember the scene, <laughs> you said big wheels move slowly. But um, yeah, I think it was just kind of, I guess, sharing our frustration and just using that to kind of come up with ways that we can push it forward because like I said, um, it's all of our responsibilities. And I also wanted to encourage everyone, um, if you didn't know about EDI before and this is your first time like to find out about it, maybe join in on a meeting, now or next year just to be encouraged to join because what we saw um talking to a lot of other um non-black asian or minority ethnic students they felt like they were taking away from BAME voices if they joined the edi and things like that which isn't the case and is something that we're really trying to get people to understand because like i said um it's all of our responsibilities and all the issues are interwoven and we just need to remember that EDI doesn't, it literally stands for equality, diversity and inclusion, so not black, Asian, minority, ethnic. So we have many different forms of discrimination, gender, um, sex and all of these things. So it's just don't feel like because you're not black, Asian or minority, ethnic, you can't come in and make a change because change is required on all of these different fronts. Um, and activist movement shouldn't stop at school either. We've got Jasmine here, we've got Emma and um, Lucy, um, I feel like I'm forgetting the names now and I feel bad, but um, basically we've got them at their part one placements and this is something that they're continuing on into work as well. And I believe that as architects and designers, um, activism is something that we're going to have to confront now and later, which is why we're trying to encourage as many people as possible to join. Um, and yeah, I'll stop speaking now, but thank you. It was quite nice to see as well, like after we did the podcast, I feel like we kind of created a wider kind of network of students within SSOA. Like I had like quite a few people message me saying that like they found the podcast quite, quite kind of like empowering. And it was really nice to hear that like their experiences weren't just like alone, like other people were kind of experiencing the same thing. Um, yeah. And I was actually wondering, Will, could you kind of send the link in the chat for anyone who hasn't already listened to it? that would be quite a nice idea but yeah i think i might have dropped it in but <clears throat> i'll send oh. it and i'll send an email out um afterwards with everything yeah that's perfect yeah lovely i'm gonna hand it off to anarina now yeah so um as you've already mentioned like um edi is like a big wheel that's moving slowly and which is great like small progress is still progress but within the group we've formed a smaller group called the Student Action Group and we just kind of really wanted to carry on these important conversations from the call to action letter which kind of felt like they're being forgotten or just kind of like you know it was important then and it's just it's still important now and we thought like a good way to do that would be through um, moving it which you know is a very nice and easy chill space there's no judgment and we held our first one during the Suas Feminist Week just before Easter and discussed Lover's Rock. If you haven't seen it, it's on um, the BBC iPlayer. Um, really great, like lots of complex issues with sexual violence and harassment and in light of Sarah Everard um, is really important. And um, yeah, so through the film, we discussed how these things sort of occur and play and especially how race and gender really affect it like especially within the pandemic um like I run and I've just noticed like the looks and sneers just sort of getting worse and things like that out and about um but and walking home at night is such an important issue and yeah so kind of all of this in the in the film is like expressed but then we spoke about it within the school and how um, being of you know color and things like that kind of really enforces well not enforces but you can get like imposter syndrome when you don't see yourself like being 
represented you kind of feel like you're not doing well you don't deserve to be in this space and that really affects your academia and like your social circles um and we also spoke about how we could get this into the curriculum because for example climate emergency like we've been aware of racial issues way before we've been aware of climate and it's like how has this managed to be enforced so much into the curriculum and you know your grades are affected but almost as architecture students we're not thinking about the wider community that we're designing for and it kind of really needs to be instilled i suppose um and yeah the first event um, the movie night was i think quite successful it was a small gathering but i think for the first event at least it it was really good for it to be intimate it really allowed us to sort of express our personal experiences and like we've already mentioned how important that is to sort of really like relate to other people and that was my favorite part at least of the whole um talk we also noticed um and spoke about how little sort of um I guess men were in these conversations and I guess it being part of feminist week within like so as we spoke about um how interesting it'd be to see the different statistics and how we need to kind of change this narrative um of being like Aisha said earlier it's not like a BAME issue it's not a women's issue it's all of our issues and we all need to sort of work together and speak about it um uh yeah so I think it was really successful we're definitely going to do another one and supplement it with some reading reading nights as well so maybe read a passage of someone's experiences not necessarily like academic writing um, and kind of discuss these themes and um, other initiatives are kind of thinking for next year perhaps would be a mentoring scheme because um, with like regardless of your education levels people of ethnic minorities are already like not getting as many jobs etc even if you're on the same like in quote marks intellectual level um and that's all to do with well not all but a lot to do with connections and we thought a mentoring scheme within the school perhaps in collaboration with SOAS would be really effective and there doesn't seem to be that many within architecture so there is the peer mentoring scheme but it's very like practice to practice you know practice a with university b if you had like a human interaction you know i could relate to anu and other people a lot more than just like this random practice and there'd be more investment to see my career progress and stuff like that um so yeah i'm just gonna pass over to danny to speak about some other initiatives we've got in the works that's brilliant um first of all i'd just like to say thank you for for uh, allowing me to participate in this, this amazing event and thanks for everybody for coming it's absolutely brilliant um yeah we've all got our, our own individual characteristics and, and i guess one of mine is being old <laughs> um yes sir uh, I, I introduced myself as an architect which i am but i'm also in the grad school here at um at sheffield university um i actually joined back in 2013 and i'm, I'm right at the end of a, a very long uh, part-time program of study and uh, hopefully submitting very soon um so i just i want to talk about a couple of things one i'm just going to talk briefly about my own background it's sort, sort of important in terms of lived experience and how that has brought me to be involved uh, in edi here at the university and the initiative i want to talk about which is the voices um, survey and some possibilities in terms of what edi can add constructively to the architecture curriculum moving forwards so yeah as i said i'm a, I'm, I'm a bit old so actually i've i've done quite a few things in my life um, my first degree back in the 80s was actually in physics um, so uh, there's a life before architecture really <laughs> and uh, so i actually worked in manufacturing industry and uh, i've also worked in the finance sector and these these are all skills i'm actually able to bring to architecture and uh, uh, a lived experience i can even bring um to to education and architecture as well uh, and then then in my 30s i turned to to architecture i wanted to be a designer um, I did actually do my, my stage uh, uh, where I am now uh, in, in Huddersfield 
and then I got a, a, my job in Manchester working for a really big practice and then, then I set up my own practice and I had a family, married, I've got two children and designed and built my own house so yeah it's just it's all, all the architect thing but I really wanted to teach but the demand is that you need to be an academic, you need a PhD so I signed up to do a PhD and I didn't really know what I was doing <laughs> I was letting myself in for not by a long chalk and so the journey started really I was started off doing something very very technical uh, involving computational fluid dynamics um, a joint venture between, between um, the School of Architecture and Civil Engineering so I had a foot in both, both camps and it was very very tough um, I struggled to get through my upgrade um, but what kept me going was the teaching you know, I absolutely loved that. Working with the students here has, has always been a massive privilege. And uh, so while I, while I was doing that, I was engaged in other stuff as well. I, I, I was uh, very active in the RIBA. And one of the things I was doing was, was, I was chair of um, the Huddersfield Society of Architects and uh, working with students at the university here. And one of the things I, I, I did, which was really, really useful, was, was channeling the funds to the student body. Um, you can actually apply directly for those funds, but you couldn't at the time. So I, I was the conduit for that money. And it enabled them to be autonomous and independent in their summer projects. And so it, we, we did quite a lot in Love Architecture Festivals, building pavilions and stuff. So that really gave me a taste for life projects and that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, um, I wanted to come out as a trans person. You know, it's, it's really difficult. It was one of the things that precipitated me leaving big practice. It was, it was very hard. I got a family. And I ended up having quite a big breakdown. And so this sort of more mix and match way of doing things, running my own practice, uh, doing teaching, doing research, is what sort of suited me at the time. Anyway, the, 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 the technical aspect of my PhD sort of ground to a halt. It couldn't be supported, but um, the, uh, the positive side of that is I, I transferred my methodology into making, which is a much more satisfactory way for me to go. Um, the, the thesis was actually on um, architecture and times, so my interest was in temporality. Now, the point there is, is that sometimes I, I, I found that as, as a trans person um, working in architecture and being involved in the institution, being involved in research and education, people assume my area of research is gender <laughs> and place. And, and go, no, 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 it's temporality and I've got a specialism in, in, in environmental design <laughs> and things like that and making, you know, I'm a crafts person. To go, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people thought sometimes may make assumptions and um, but sometimes that works in your favor um, the RIBA said well do you want to be a role model then and, and work on EDI stuff I said well what's that <laughs> and of course I got involved with no idea what it is and the next you know this, this is this was about six years ago and all this time later I've been on judging panels for the um, the LGBT pride down in London, been on floats in pride and all this sort of stuff, um, done um, presentations in EDI in a number of universities now and it just, just started to take off a little bit and this year I've actually been developing um, EDI content for architecture courses um, which I'll come on to in a minute. So, um, so this year I've been involved in the, the resurgent EDI group at um, Sheffield University, which uh, uh, Keith's been leading, um, Catherine Skelter, and it's 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 been really really positive, and it's been fantastic just to hear some of you talking about the initiatives, like the call to action, the podcast. These are really important. So the first uh, initiative I've been involved in there is the voices survey now this has been considerable hard work and I'd, I'd just like to thank you know victoria and anno for the feedback that you've given that was really really useful in developing that and i'd like to thank rena for the hard work on doing the technical development and, and i've participated in the authoring of the content and we actually 
finished it today. <laughs> so there's something to celebrate there. Um, so th this is actually hot off the press. So similarly, I want you to, to look out for this. Uh, in about two weeks' time, this is going to be rolled out by the school. The Voices Survey. This is for both staff and students. One of the arguments I was making in the EDI group, equality, diversity and inclusion. We can't do the verb bit, the inclusion, until we know where we are. What are the issues? What, what actually is the state? What are people saying? How can we get to those particular parts of the school which need to be looked at first? And this is, this is what we're addressing in the survey. So I'm not going to go into the detail of the survey now. You can see it when it comes out. It speaks for itself. Okay. Now we're aiming for an 80% response. Okay, that's the ambition. So that's going to be the headline. When it rolls out, we want an 80% response. And the easy bit is filling it in. Then it comes back to us. Then we've got all the hard work to do to analyze the outcome and put it, put some, you know, feed it back into our strategy. We're going to learn from it and we're going to use it to support the school. So it could could be things that we we, we learn things about. Which, which parts of our courses need to be decolonized and things like that, or who's got access to resources. There's lots and lots of stuff that's going to come out, so please look out for it. Now, the final thing I wanted to mention um, was uh, some of the other content I've been developing. So I, I've got um, a seminar which can attach to um, professional studies. So both in undergraduate and at master's level you do professional studies as part of your accredited courses, but I think this is also something that also applies to our PGT probably as well, could be really useful. And this really examines what we mean by equality, what we mean by diversity, and actually what the mechanisms of inclusion can be. But actually looking at the profession in a very broad sense and actually seeing what all the institutions attached to architecture are actually saying, but also looking at what all the institutions attached to architecture are doing as well. And then within that sort of program, formulating a strategy. So this is something that all students in the school can do. And this then becomes a, a vehicle to say, well, okay, on my course, this is a strategic approach to decolonizing. Uh, what if it happens to be. So thank you very much for listening and, um, and thank you to everybody else and, and all the hard work that they're doing as well. Yeah, thank you. I think the last thing that we're going to talk about, I just wanted to add one thing um, and then I think we'll be opening it up to questions. So if you have questions, as Will had said earlier, please, you can write them in the chat, raise your hand. Um, but the last thing is just to, to say all, everyone has also received this email uh, a month or so ago about Field Journal. Field Journal is a school um, publication, Journal of Architecture, that's published from the Sheffield School of Architecture. And so the next issue is actually going to be focused on a response to the call to action. So I'm just going to put a link in the chat. But I'm um, just to say that, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the email. Please do not write this off. Please take a moment and look at this email, because I think um, oftentimes we think about journals and we think, oh my gosh, this is something academic, this is for the researchers, this is not for me. But what we really, there's a number of editors on this, it's myself, um, Emma Cheadle, who's here, Carolyn Butterworth, Luis Hernan, Catalina Mejia Moreno, and so I'm sure many of you know these folks, but the idea is also to open up this as a response from individuals in the school, both staff and students, so this is open we're really hoping for creative, critical reflections. Um, these do not, we're not necessarily expecting sort of like an academic article. This is really open in terms of, you know, like a variety of formats. You can take work that you've produced or that you're producing as part of maybe like your dissertation or thesis, something from your design work where you're reflecting on these issues, uh, another kind of response that you wanna make to the call to action. And these are open to a variety of formats. So for example, it could be text, it can be audio, it can be video, it can be visual, it can be projects. I'm actually um, organizing something with a couple of alumni and some other folks that I know um, from the Sheffield School of Architecture or who have relations, and we're going to do a collective conversation where we're going to think about our own sort of provocations and have a conversation and transcribe that and use that to share. So please think creatively if you have any questions. Um, 
I'll, I guess we, everyone has received the email, but just to say, you know, don't self select yourself out. Don't filter yourself out. Please think about, I think we, cause as others have said, like we all have something really critical to contribute making this School of Architectural and Anti-Racist Institution takes the work of all of us. And so we really do welcome everyone's participation, whether you're a staff member, whether you're, whether you're a student, we really wanna hear from you and to think creatively about what you might be able to share. So I put a link and then, yeah, I think that's that. If you, anybody else wants to add anything, or please, we, we really wanna hear from you, any questions or comments that you have for all of us. just want to quickly add as well a common kind of misconception might be that you kind of have to be a person of color to fill out the um ssoa voices survey but that's just not how it is the survey doesn't like ask you like what your ethnicity is or like what your background is it just wants to kind of collect the data and kind of information from everyone as a whole and just like see where everyone stands um so yeah that's why that's why we want to have like a kind of 80 percent plus participation so like if you think it's like kind of not for you or not relevant then you know that's not how it is kind of like we just want to like know what everyone kind of thinks and yeah that's what i want to say <laughs> and I, i'm not sure i think it's like next week is that right tiny where are you in, in two weeks time I'm so sorry. Just one thing I forgot to say for the sealed journal that the deadline, if you want to express your interest, is May 21st. So you don't have to have completed whatever you'd like to contribute, but just send us an email with whatever you would like to contribute, and we would love to work with you from there. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, guys. There was so much to take in there and um, some really beautiful presentations. Um, so we'll open it up for questions. Um, if people want to raise their hand, if they have a question, stick a cue in the chat box or just type it out. Um, I'll kick it off and start. Um, and it's sort of touching on what Victoria and Aisha were, were talking about, about meeting each other um, and forming uh, networks um, across the school. Um, and it seems, it sort of seems to me this, the past 12 months have made it easier to to reach out now we've been in these sort of digital spaces. Um, and my question is to you guys, how we can sort of reimagine how studios work and how the school works when we move back to in-person teaching um, to carry on forming more connections and so that they can form quicker um, when students get to the school as well. I don't know I was listening so story. much that I missed the question. Were you saying how? <laughs> yeah, so like, like when in person, um, how we can sort of reimagine the studio space and how we interact sort of uh, vertically through the school, not just in year groups. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does make sense. I just, I don't know, I just love listening to you. Um, I, think, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I think <sighs> just not be scared to talk to someone else. I don't know if fear is what it is um because like when i first came to the school the first where i even met another person of color i was just in the lift um this was karen in third year and she goes are you nigerian and i'm like no nah. <laughs> you see every any black person you see you think they're nigerian and then just started talking from there and then that led to meeting other people but then within our year group specifically i remember literally back in first year talking about this with Ayushi and I just noticed such a divide and I don't know why. So for me personally, I just speak to everyone um, whenever I need to and just, it's helped me form connections with different people, um, whatever level that connection is at. I think just forget about, well not forget about, but just don't let that be a barrier to meeting someone. There's more to someone than just, I guess, what you get at face value. Um, and then there's more to us than just architecture because a lot of the time especially in first year you work with people on group projects you see them again and it's like i don't know you anymore and i feel like that's something that you need to we all need to contest because if we've worked if we've worked together for i don't know four weeks we definitely do know something about each other we can start to talk about the work and that could lead to other conversations so i think let's just take the opportunity whenever it presents itself um Hopefully next year people can start, I don't know, the group travels again to Edinburgh or 
wherever it is i think all of those are hidden opportunities that the school give to us so we just need to make use of it um because at the end of the day we will need all the connections all the friends and everything and it would be nice i guess to do like a 10-year everyone comes back meet up what's going on with your life and it would be a shame if you didn't use the connections that you had now um, i don't know if that answers it but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that was really nice no definitely um uh did jasmine raise a hand um i don't know i did <laughs> Um, did. Yeah, I did. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, you know, well, first off, I just want to say that this is really cool. This is happening in the first place, just because I feel like, you know, when I was here last year, I would have never seen this happening. Um, and so it's really cool to kind of give these conversations this space um, and obviously to see kind of everything and hear what's going on, because obviously kind of being alumni, you're kind of um, removed from these kind of conversations that are happening within SSOA. Um, so my, converse, my my question was really just on why race data wasn't being collected as part of the SSA Voices survey. Um, I was just kind of wondering how come that was going to be left off of the, the form. Okay. Um, yeah, just um, just to clarify that then, it, the, um, the um, characteristics such as ethnicity are included. It's just that you, you, the way that it's asked is not asked, it, you're not asked, are you? You're okay, asked, yeah. does ethnicity affect you? Okay, so that way it's inclusive for everybody. Okay, and then there's a whole set of characteristics which are based on the protected characteristics from the Equality Act. So it includes, you know, uh, gender and other things. So it's, uh, it's, it's well thought through. And uh, yeah, no, when, amazing. When, yeah. You, when you do the survey, it will answer your question for you. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, but yeah, thank, thank you for clarifying. I mean, I don't think I'll, I'll see the survey because I don't think it's going to alumni. But yeah, no, that's really good because I think a lot of the stuff we kind of raised in EDI last year and kind of raised in the letter was how obviously, yeah, race does impact these things and how you can't see things as colorblind because obviously race has so much impact. So yeah, yeah it's really it's great to, to know there. that. Absolutely yeah. There, yeah. <laughs> awesome. um was there a question um from Shahab. Shahab? yeah yeah you unmute and uh take it away mm. is he still here Uh, feel free to type it if uh, if your mic's not working. Um, no, he's left. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's throwing me off a bit. Hi, hi. Um, sorry, I don't know if my Wi-Fi was going weird. I just wanted to say, Susie, I didn't see your message in the chat earlier, but Happy Lesbian Visibility Day. I think that's definitely mm -hmm. worth mentioning. That's really made me happy. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Happy, oh. happy lesbian visibility day everyone Whoop. nice guys <laughs> let us know if anything's happening i i didn't even yeah. know about it. i was wondering what's going on to celebrate you know what i didn't even know it was happening today um but yeah i'm on the hunt for some interesting talks to attend this evening because there's always there's always stuff going on so um you know support the lesbians who are around you and have a hunt for some interesting talks to, to listen to this evening because it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, yeah Chad. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Susie. That was. Um... Yes. Yeah, sorry, I lost connection. I hope you can hear me now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I was saying, yeah, I was thanking everyone for sharing their experiences today and also introducing us to EDI. Um, he did speak about the barriers between different year groups. And I feel this is like more important now with the COVID situation, especially for international students who are joining the uni, which might feel isolated. Um, as a new PGR student myself, who's also international and a person of color, I can say that this feeling of isolation is more evident amongst probably PGRs. Um, I did look at the EDI, uh, information on the uni website and i saw that you are currently um 
gathering evidence uh, about international PhD students' experience and how that differs from home students. I just wanted to see if there's anybody in the group who knows uh, what has so far been discovered and what is issues exist and how how that's been planning to be uh, addressed. Do you want to just, just quickly say that, that uh, um, you, you, you also identify yourself as a PGR on the Voices survey as well. So your, your concerns are really important. Uh, I, I've also experienced isolation as a PGR as well. And yes, uh, the, the Voices survey will, will, will uh, enable you to, to provide feedback on that. Okay, thank you. I was going to say, um, we currently, none of us over here are international students, we're all home students, so I don't know how I can really answer that, but I'll definitely like put that in with our next EDI meeting. Um, and if you want to email any of us, or Kith as well, um, I'll make sure to put my email in at the end. Um, you can email us if you have any other questions, but I'll definitely definitely bring that up in the next EDI meeting because, yeah, we don't often talk about international students because none of us are, but yeah, that's all, thanks. Yeah, sure, thank you, that would be very nice. I also just wanted to say thank you for, help for, your, for your question because I think also it's really important what you said in terms of, also in terms of isolation of particular groups of students within the within the Sheffield School of Architecture. And I think this is really, really an important point that I think we sometimes forget. Um, the way in which, you know, when we're talking about the Sheffield School of Architecture, which programs do we often have in mind? I'm not going to say, but I think we all know. <laughs> um, and I think it's, you know, so for example, like, I think those that often are, I mean, I think it would be interesting, for example, just a small exercise of sort of like people saying wh which program or whatever their affiliation is within the school. Because I think I've, I'm an international student. I was a PGR in architecture. I often did a lot of teaching with um, the Masters in Urban Design program, which is often many, many um, international students, almost exclusively international students, many coming from China. And I think there is this other question of sort of, um, I think we have to remember that different programs often maybe have their own challenges in terms of representation and things like that, but also within the school of the school of architecture conversations, who's often included, right? Um, hmm. And obviously it's informed by like the lengths of our programs, the extent to which we can figure out what's going on and sort of really participate in, in changing it. Can I also just add in something quick? I feel like I keep plugging. Um, I, um, I think this is why it's important as well to have as many people as possible join the EDI because when we're all from these different um, backgrounds, we can have, I guess, because as much as possible, we'd like to try to tackle everything. It would always be good to have someone um, at the forefront of that to lead the way and say, no, you're doing this wrong. And I think this is how it should be done. Um, also, I think most of us here um, won't be here next year. So we'd love for EDI to continue and just we can join in whenever possible. So I think just encourage everyone to find out as much about it as possible. Can I just add that, um, thank you so much, Aisha, for that point. I think, I know for me personally, my engagements and sort of and um, trying to be active and working with students was, for me, it preceded my involvement in EDI. So I think there is room for, it's really important EDI as this sort of set up platform in which people can participate and should participate to really, it's a really nice way to especially engage with staff members to make change, but also maybe EDI doesn't have to be the only way and it's probably not also the only way that students and staff as well are trying to initiate change. So I think just to say that, that I think, I know I came to EDI with a specific purpose of what I wanted to try to achieve, but I already really had that in mind and I've always been doing things outside, but definitely I think it's important to use EDI to build these collaborations and to facilitate change as well. And I think it's like a really great place to learn as well. Like I've learned so much from all of these conversations I've had with people such so much that it's informed my design and studio. Like I feel more confident in talking about my lived experience and how that relates to it. And to know that that's a valid source of knowledge and how, and that's like now impacting my dissertation and everything. And I think 
if I hadn't joined EDI, I mean, I can, I did my own work as well, obviously, but I'm just, my knowledge is so much richer now from like having these conversations with people different to me. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um, and yeah, I just hope that your guys' work can carry on into the future. Um, has anyone got any more questions or things to add to the discussion? I was going to ask Danny for um, the voices survey because I think Jasmine kind of touched on it. Could it be something that's sent out to um, people who have graduated recently? Because I guess their experience in the school is still still relevant yeah. as well. Yes, thank, thank you for that question. That, that, that's precisely actually one of the, one of the, uh, the things that we're considering the rollout. So we're, we're just doing the mechanics of the rollout now and uh, uh, I'm inclined to agree. So obviously controlling uh, who the form gets rolled out to uh, is, is, is really important. So we, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly consider that. It, if, we, if, if we're not able to do it, it might be to do with technical factors rather than, rather than yeah. design to do it, but we'll, 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 we'll certainly um, put that on the table. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, yeah. Is there any more questions? Can I, can I chip, can I chip on, on, on yes. that one? Um, hi, uh, I, I think what Danny was just saying, I think technically there might be problems about um, sending the survey out to people who have graduated a long time ago, but certainly I can't imagine there'd be a problem that would very easily be able to send the survey out to recent graduates who are still, for instance, with us for a uh, year in practice experience and so on. So I can't imagine there being a problem with that. If, if they've got a, a Sheffield University account, then, then it's easy, yeah. Yeah, I think, I do, I think generally they don't yeah. uh, these days, but we do have um, email addresses for the students who are enrolled with us for a year in practice. Okay, okay. So we can, we and then Louise Lacorno looks after that. Lovely. Um, so it's approaching two o'clock, so I guess everyone might want to go and get some food or maybe a walk outside in the sunshine. Um, but thank you so much, um, everyone, for coming. I think the turnout for this lunchtime talk um, has been really quite amazing. Um, Kith, do you have, yeah, oh, Q, 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 go, go. Hello, super quick. Thank you so much. You're all brilliant. Um, uh, 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 I just thought I'd take this opportunity because uh, I'm thinking of changing uh, the time of the next meeting. Danny and I were talking about this earlier. So because no, because nobody can come, and also it's on a studio day, which is always a bad idea. So I'm thinking of putting it on Wednesday afternoon at 3.30. Did I get that right, Danny? So, so yeah, so Wednesday afternoon, 3.30. So it's hot off the press. Yeah, and if you're interested in just coming along just to say hi, got an open door policy so you're very very welcome just drop me an email um so yeah thanks guys perfect um and as well i'll send out another email following this with links to everything that's been covered hopefully i don't i've written it all down um but uh hopefully i don't miss anything um i'll check with victoria before i send it off but yeah thanks everyone for coming um it's been a pleasure to host this session um, and and hear from you, uh, your guys' experience. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I'm sure everyone else is clapping. You just can only hear from me. I'll turn my mic on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye, Thanks, guys. Guys, um, and enjoy your afternoon. Bye. 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 Bye guys.